Good morning, everybody. We're still letting some folks in from the waiting room, so we'll give them a minute to join and we will get started here momentarily. All right, good morning, folks. We're a couple minutes after nine, and I think everybody that had joined us uh, is in the meeting now. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, if other folks are able to join throughout the morning, we'll certainly let them in and invite them to participate. But thank you all for being a part of our fourth quarter Palmetto Vision Alliance meeting. It's great to see everyone this morning. Um, we will uh, wait to do introductions until after uh, our guest speaker when we get to our um, group discussion time, but um, I just wanted to take this moment to recognize uh, Taryn Mason, who has recently joined uh, Operation Site as their new executive director. Uh, welcome, Taryn, and thank you so much for jumping right in and participating in the Palmetto Vision Alliance. We're thrilled to have you with us this morning. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Awesome. Without any further ado, I'm going to hand things over to our guest speaker this morning, Dr. Mary Sedgwick. Uh, Dr. Sedgwick is an incredible civic leader from the Asheville, North Carolina area. Uh, she's been involved in a number of um, initiatives and boards and community groups over the years, including Lions Clubs in North Carolina. And she is currently the uh, chair of the Programs and Events Committee at Lions Vision Services. She's here to talk with us this morning about being differently abled and perfectly capable uh, as part of our effort to continue um, engaging and hearing directly uh, from those in the community with vision impairments that our organizations are seeking to come alongside and serve and empower and lead with. So Dr. Sedgwick, thank you so much for being with us this morning and we look forward to your exciting presentation. Well, thank you, Daniel. And thank you to each of you for being here this morning. Um, I'd just like to thank you for this opportunity to share my story and insight with you today. But let me begin by expressing how grateful and blessed I feel to be here today. As you may know, I was first scheduled to speak with you in March of this year. And due to a life-changing event that occurred on February 17th, I had to reschedule. On that day, I suffered a massive ischemic stroke. I sat beside my partner in the car, unable to speak, and the left side of my body completely paralyzed. I am now eight months out from my stroke. I am out of the wheelchair, I'm walking, physically able to speak, and have recovered far beyond the lifetime wheelchair user my medical providers told me I would be. I would like to celebrate this moment with you today because this is the first day I am allowing myself as a, to present publicly in my new state of being with my left arm and hand contracted and a brain that truly has a mind of its own when it comes to moving my left arm and deciding whether I can get the word that I want from my brain to my lips, a condition called anomic aphasia. I have learned mechanisms with, through speech therapy to work through this and circumvent the anomic aphasia quite well. But if by chance my brain decides to show off, and I desperately seek for a word, no, we will get there. There may be an awkward moment of silence, but it will happen. Shortly after my stroke, somebody asked me how I was feeling, and I responded, like a cat with nine lives crossed with the Energizer Bunny. I'm proving it is hard to keep a good woman down. I hope by sharing with you today my authentic self with you, and with all my vulnerabilities, I can help you to see the individuals with disabilities as a whole person who are not defined by their disability. 
you know, when I first lost my sight, I started seeing a therapist. And I said to her, please help me. Everyone keeps making nasty jokes about my disability and what it means about me being inferior to them. I'm constantly hearing thoughtless, heartless reminders of how I'm different from other people and lacking one of the five senses they have. She proved to be the world's worst therapist when she responded. I see. As we spend this time together, you would discover I am the first to laugh at my own ailments, predicaments, as shown in my previous statement about the therapist. I also chose many years ago not to define myself as disabled. I adopted the term differently abled. I grew up with supportive parents who instilled in me that nothing, that anything was possible. And the only thing that was in my way with the barriers, and the only barriers in my way were my own disbeliefs in myself. There is no doubt my life has been challenged by one adversity after the next. One thing that always rang true for me personally is that I refused to allow the way others viewed me or the limitations that society wanted to place upon me to defy me or dictate what I can and cannot do. I am differently able. The means and ways I complete a task will not always look like the way most people do it. And there is always a way for me to do it. What I'd like to do today is begin by giving you a little more about my background, the medical challenges I have faced and how I am the person I am today. From there, we will give you some examples of the indoctrination about disability instilled to me as a child growing up that molded my current outlooks of my own disability and others view of me. With that framework, we will then, I will then share about my civic engagements with boards and nonprofit organizations as a visually, differently abled, visually impaired individual. I hope to have some time at the end to answer some questions and give you the safety in this space and time to explore the, with curiosity some of the questions you might have or are now surfacing about a person with a disability. So let's begin with an encounter that occurred very early in my life that truly shaped my path. One of my earliest memories and most vivid was at Thanksgiving when I was three years old. I was just leaving the kitchen with my mother and my grandmother basting the turkey, walking down the hallway into towards the family room where 25, 25 plus other family members were gathered. As I reached the threshold of the family room, my aunt asked me, Mary, what do you wanna be when you grow up? I quickly responded, a doctor. And to that, she said to me, no, Mary, little girls grow up to be nurses. Well, with my blonde curls tussled to the side, my chest thrust forward, my hands placed firmly on my hip, I said, no, I am going to be a doctor. That day cemented my career path and I never wavered since. Now I'm gonna fast forward about 15 years of my life that were filled with participating in every sport possible and keeping my eyes set on the goal of going to college and medical school. After high school, I attended Queens University in Charlotte, North Carolina on a full academic scholarship. Somehow I decided to major in biochemistry and had the six last upper, upper level biochemistry courses one-on-one -on -one with my professors. I was well on my way to medical school. I chose Brody School of Medicine in East Carolina University because for the last 10 years, they had been named number one in primary care. I was thriving throughout medical school. And then one Sunday in October of my fourth year, I was sitting in the passenger seat of a friend's car. As I turned to look at her, I suddenly experienced an onset of dizziness and double vision. The next morning when I woke up, I couldn't hold a cup in my left hand. I was determined to go in that next morning to the car do my cardiology rotation with Dr. Rose. And as I sat there in the first five minutes, attempting to read EKGs. And if you know anything about EKGs, they're on graphs. And when you have double vision and dizziness, it makes it very difficult. But within that first five minutes, he looked at me and started doing a medical examination. 
The next thing I know, I was in the car with him headed to the neurologist's office across the street from the hospital. 15 minutes later, I was in an MRI machine. Within an hour, I was admitted to the hospital and diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Up to that point, my experience with MS patients were those that were confined to the hospital, unable to care for themselves due to the severity of their illness. My life was turned upside down in less than two hours. By that evening, my mom had flown in from Chicago and was at my side. Her love and support and encouraging words over the next week ignited the same determination I felt as that three-year-old child. And my dream of becoming a doctor was not going to be cut short. In May, I walked across the graduation stage, rece stage receiving my medical degree. And two months later, began my residency in Asheville, North Carolina in obstetrics and gynecology at Mission Hospital. I had found my dream specialty, delivering babies, bringing them new lives into the world, providing primary care to women, and utilizing my hands that were meant to operate. I firmly believed laughter is the best medicine. I was the one who was playing practical jokes on the residents, my fellow residents and attending physicians, such as putting KY jelly in their croc shoes when they went to sleep at night, and then paging them to, with a fake 911 emergency delivery in labor and delivery. As they would slip into their shoes, I'd be outside their door laughing, and they would just begin shaking their head. It went on to in my interactions with my patients. As women would deliver their babies with me, I would have them laugh. Laughter is a natural painkiller. And when you laugh, you utilize the same muscles as when you push. My life was on course to be exactly what I had dreamt it to be. Then the rigors of residency with the 36 plus hour days and 100 hour weeks began taking its toll on my body. I had several MS flare-ups and towards the end of residency, I was having trouble with my vision and depth perception. It's a condition called optic neuritis, which is a direct manifestation of MS affecting the optic nerve. And I also was, had an undiagnosed condition of optic atrophy. A few months later, I had to make the most difficult decision in my life for the safety of my parents, my parents, my patients. I resigned from practicing. The day I walked out of the hospital, I lost my identity. I only knew myself as a doctor and as a damn good one. Over the course of the next three years, my vision continued to worsen. And during those three years, I fell into a deep depression, finding it very difficult to get out of bed each morning. On March 4th, 2004, when I woke up that morning, I woke up into complete darkness where I was sitting there in my bed, paralyzed in fear, unable to remember where the numbers were on a phone to even call for help. And then out of nowhere came this inner voice bursting with courage, determination, and will saying to me, your light still needs to shine. Get moving. With that, I literally stumbled out of bed, found the phone, and miraculously, somehow, dialed my father. From there, I started searching out resources in the Asheville area for the visually impaired and ways for me to begin living my life in this new reality. By August of 2004, I was residing at the North Carolina Rehabilitation Center for the Visually Impaired in Raleigh, North Carolina. I stayed there for nine months, learning assistive technology, uh, braille, uh, safe ways to cook and live independently. And I entered the state program to assist visually impaired individuals to start their own business. I decided to start a motivational speaking business. With that, I began jet setting across the United States. In 2005, I received my first leader dog Wrangler. Wrangler and I, we're traveling all across the country, speaking to big corporations and small and everything in between. Unfortunately, four years later, Wrangler passed away from cancer. 
I was blessed six months after that to receive my next angel, leader dog Lucy. Lucy picked up the reins, carrying on where Wrangler left off. As Helen Keller once said, a bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the turn. Lucy and I made that turn together and we were soaring to new heights. After losing my sight and during this time of speaking nationally, I sought out a mental health life coach to dive in and do some deep work. Some 20 years later, I'm still a work in progress and I know who I am, all my strengths, weaknesses, irritating habits, and my joy of living a full life. Most of all, I have found a love more precious than any I've ever known, a love for myself. The identity I hold of myself is no longer tied to a career path, position, or disease. I am a strong-willed, determined woman who courageously faces her fears and accepts challenges instead of running from them and has found an inner vision so vivid it obscures the need for physical sight. I used to think of life as a set of points to be reached, milestones, and goals. The loss of my vision forced me to view life as a journey. You know, maybe journey, maybe the journey isn't so much about becoming anything. Maybe it's more about unbecoming everything that isn't really you so you can be who you were meant to be in the first place. While on discovery of my true self and acceptance of vision loss, I began to flourish, living a fuller, mean, more meaningful life than I'd ever seen. Most everyone is familiar with Helen Keller's famous quote, when one door of happiness closes, another door opens. I can honestly say my journey has been one door closing and the next opening with times of being in a revolving door, always finding the exact moment to step out and go on. That is exactly what happened at the North Carolina State Lions State Convention in 2018 in Greensboro, North Carolina. On April 27th, 2018, in the mid afternoon, I arrived at the hotel and as always, leader dog Lucy led me straight to that revolving door. There was something about her popping out on the other side, making that grand entrance that she loved. That moment exiting the revolving, exiting the revolving door in the hotel lobby led to an opportunity that changed my life once again. I was given the opportunity to try these e-sight glasses after being told for 15 years there would be nothing that would help my vision. It was on that day I saw for myself the love in Lucy's eyes looking back at me that I'd always felt in my heart from the moment she walked in my life. I also saw the every detail of her beautiful eyelashes and the faces of some 75 lions lining the hallway, witnessing my miracle. On that day, my life once again did a complete about face. I had learned to see in a world of darkness and had a fulfilling life. And now bringing sight back into my life was unnerving. A part of me did not want to resort to the preconceived influences of visual appearance and nonverbal communications that sight provided. I took the leap of faith and have since helped hundreds of individuals all over the world experience eSight and other vision technology, fundraising tens of thousands of dollars so that others could receive the gift of sight too. I honestly feel my life has come full circle. I started with a career bringing new lives into this world, and now I am giving new life to the visually impaired. There is a poem by Emily Dickinson that speaks volumes to the one thing I never lost, hope. The first verse goes like this. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without words and never stops at all. As I mentioned in the beginning, my views and value of myself as differently abled has been influenced by my experiences as a child and the profound impact those experiences had on me. 
My first memory of somebody with a physical challenge was in the third and fourth grade. Every day at recess and after school, we would all gather around the tether to play tetherball. Now, if you know what tetherball is, it is simply a pole with a rope tied to the top with a ball at the bottom, and you would hit it in your direction, trying to wrap the ball around the pole before the other person did it in their direction. Well, every day, the championship would come down to Todd and I. Todd had cerebral palsy. And now I'm very familiar with the awkward movements that Todd made every day as he played against me in tetherball. Todd was a tough com competitor. I did not see him lacking in any skill or ability. Quite the opposite. I saw Todd as the tetherball champion, proudly standing there with his awkward movements, defeating one player after the next. The next experience was probably during the summers between when I was 10 to 14 years of age. My brothers and I would stay at the community recreation center while my parents went to work. And right away, I began playing stickball the whole day. That first week of the first year, 10 years of age, I met Brad and we became teammates because he was an awesome stickball player. Brad was also deaf. And before I knew it, I was learning some sign language and communicating with Brad. While we would be playing today, I would observe other kids laughing behind Brad's back because of the awkward noises he would make. Now I knew Brad could not hear them, but I knew he knew what was happening. Their actions were quickly put to rest when Brad and I would challenge them to a game of stickball. The result? Another game won by us and a little more acceptance of his different way of communicating. Now, as my doctors look back, they say my first episode of multiple sclerosis actually occurred in my junior year, before just the summer before my junior year in high school. I had a sudden onset of foot drop, not being able to lift my foot, my toes dragging on the floor, and it required me to wear a brace in order to walk. Fortunately, I was able to continue on the swim team. I would walk up to that starting block with the brace on, and when I got to the block, take the brace off and awkwardly climb up onto the starting block, getting ready for that whistle to blow. My parents were always in the stand at every meet. And during my first event of every meet, while I awkwardly climbed on that starting block, my parents would hear the other parents in the stand say, Look at the poor crippled child. My parents would sit and just wait because they knew as soon as that whistle blew and I landed in that water, I would leave the other parents' children in the wake. At the end of the race, my parents would turn to the other parents and proudly say, yes, that is our poor crippled child and just smile from ear to ear. Another positive experience I had was in the spring of my junior year of high school when I was unable to participate, participate in track and field due to the foot drop. My high school contacted two LPGA players, Barb Mucha and Sandy Jaskel, and started a women's golf team for me so I could participate in a sport. My principal and other coaches did not see me as not being able to do anything. They saw an opportunity to introduce something new and challenging. To this day, I love the game of golf and consider it one of my most enjoyable sports. There are just a few, these are just a few examples of my early encounters and experiences of being differently abled and how they shaped my outlook on my life. Just as there have been positive experiences, I have faced negative and discriminatory actions. As I previously stated, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis six months before graduating from medical school. As I lay there in the hospital bed, each of the medical school administrators came in my room over the course of a week, trying to get me to drop out of medical school. I could not believe what I was hearing. Minimal concern was being voiced for my personal well being, emphasis was being placed on graduation success rate. This was the medical school that emphasized communication and interpersonal skills. How could they even think that I would walk away so close to the prize? Their words reminded me of my aunt's words when I was three years old. 
They ignited a fire in me to walk across that graduation stage. And I proudly did so with each one of those administrators standing on the stage to shake my hand. Around 2005, I had a serious medical emergency and was taken to the hospital in an ambulance. While in the back of the ambulance in acute distress, the medic started speaking in an extremely loud voice. I know we've all heard this before. Those that can't see, can't hear. But he was also talking in a slow cadence as if I was uh, mentally slow. I did not have the energy to communicate with him. I was overwhelmed with the medical emergency. Looking back, I am well aware of the social media constructs and possible interactions with other people who were deaf and blind that may have influenced his behavior. Although I was unable to say anything to him that day, I did begin speaking yearly at Asheville Buncombe Community College's EMT program to raise awareness and sensitivity. I have been actively involved in Lions Club International at the local, state, and international level. While attending a district meeting about 10 years ago, I was walking into the meeting with another person and we sat down at two seats in the front of the room. And, you know, one of the North, North Lions Club's international main focus is uh, visual impairment and blindness prevention. Helen Keller in 1945 at the International Convention asked the Lions to become Knights of the Blind. Roughly 10 minutes after sitting down, a Lion member who was extremely involved with the visually impaired came up to me and started yelling at me for taking a seat. I was kind of perplexed and, and looked up towards him like, what are you talking about? I mean, there was nothing on the table or the chair. He pointed out his notebook under the table leaning on the leg of the table. I couldn't help but laugh. He started raising a commotion and the next thing I heard him yelling to everyone else was that I took his seat and I didn't need to be sitting in the front of the room anyway because I couldn't see. I could not believe my ears. Those words were coming from someone who was supposed to be a knight for the blind. Now, let's go to 2016 when I was on a cruise of the Pacific Coast during a stop in Santa Barbara. My friends and I had stopped at a coffee shop to get some coffee on the way to a car rental business to rent a car. Upon arriving at the car rental business, I sat on a bench outside holding my now empty cup of coffee, wearing my sunglasses, and with my white cane, minding my own business. That's when I felt my cup jostle and heard a few coins clink in the cup. I was dumbfounded. As I sat there, not saying a word and minding my own business, my coffee cup collected over $68 in the next 10 minutes while my friends were inside renting the car. My friends came out to find me laughing hysterically. They were ready to defend me while I found humor in the assumptions people made after the first person started putting coins in the cup. Robert Hensel, who was born with spina bifida and holds the world record for the longest wheelie in a wheelchair. I said the phrase this time, I did it. <laughs> Memor summarizes disability culture best with this. There is no greater disability in society than an ability to see people as more. I have talked about being differently abled and let me give you some examples. I mentioned earlier that I grew up swimming competitively and swimming has always been my means of stress relief. When I was losing my sight, I feared losing the ability to get into the pool and swim for hours, lap after lap. I adopted by viewing swimming as a form of meditation. For me, I began counting my strokes from one wall to the next and eventually finding my ryth rhythm and began adding in flip turns at each wall. I would swim one mile or 72 lengths of the pool without stopping and repeat it two or three times before I got out. That hard concrete tile lined wall was not going to be the barrier preventing me from finding my serenity in that water. About six years ago, I decided to take a pottery wheel class. Upon showing up for the first class, the instructor was a bit perplexed on how this was going to work. She quickly learned from me 
that centering clay on the wheel came with less resistance when her vision was removed. I began making beautiful cups and bowls and plates, filling the clay and allowing my hands to create. And then there is most recently post-stroke. I have numerous rose bushes in my front yard and I'm posting pictures of my roses on Facebook all the time. This spring, I was able to use my cane and get to the rose bushes and sit with my folding chair and prune them and tenderly care for them. As I was doing that, came the realization that the yard guys had not done such a great job of removing all the leaves from underneath the azalea bushes. So one Saturday morning, I got up early. Oh, wait a second. I forgot to tell you that one of my Lions Club members here locally, when I got out of the rehab, brought me a scooter. Yes, a motorized scooter. Now, let me remind you, I am visually impaired. And even with these eSight glasses with a limited field of vision, it is not compatible with driving. So I get up early that morning. I gather, I got my cane, fall four from cane. I gather a rake, a large tarp, and bungee cords, and a folding chair, pile it all on top of the scooter with me. And I set up up, up, the, up the driveway and up the road, park it along the road in front of the first bed, get off, lay that tarp out across the grass, take the folding chair to the first azalea bush and with one arm rake all the leaves out and slowly move all the leaves onto the tarp. I then hobble around and take the bungee cords and secure the tarp to the back of the scooter. With that tarp about four feet tall and eight feet long piled with leaves, I set up up the road, down the driveway, through the fence and into the backyard. Mission accomplished. Those front beds never looked so good. So as you can see, my method was different and I was perfectly capable. This also led to a few more escapes and joy rides around the neighborhood on the scooter. I feel like at this point, there should be some message going across your screen saying, do not attempt this at home. So how does all of this lead to my civic involvement? I am a product of parents who serve their community and they ingrained in me at a very young age, the joy living a life of service gives your soul. Ed Sullivan said, if you do a good job for others, you heal yourself at the same time because a dose of joy is a spiritual cure. It transcends all barriers. I grew up witnessing my parents' services to others the joy it brought those they served and the abundant joy they shared together because of their service. The first act of service I remember was Christmas Eve when I was three years old, excuse me, five years old. My aunt and three cousins, ages one, two, and four, showed up on our doorstep on Christmas Eve. I remember seeing my mom in the living room consoling my aunt. And shortly after, my dad came up to me and asked me to join him on a Christmas mission. I got in the car with him and on the way to the toy store, he explained to me that my uncle was not around and my aunt and cousins needed my help. Sitting there in the warmth of the car with my dad, he shared with me the secret of Santa Claus and he was officially appointing me to an elf, elf to help him find toys for my cousins to have under the tree. Now, my dad was a school teacher and my mom stayed at home and took care of myself and my three brothers. We did not have money. And in that moment, I told my father to take some of my toys from under the tree to give to my cousins. That Christmas morning became the most memorable Christmas for me. I witnessed the magic on my cousins' faces as they opened their gifts and my heart swelled with more joy than any toy could ever bring. That's when my life of service began and it hasn't stopped. So now let's do a quick fast forward to me facing the world as a visually impaired individual. And as I began to navigate what resources were available to assist me to live the best fullest life with vision loss, I discovered those with vision loss did not have a voice at the table of leading services and organizations in the community. 
I was asked in January of 2005 to join the Lions Club after someone from Asheville heard me speak at a Lions meeting in Raleigh. This led to a board position on the Mountain Area Reading Radio Service for the Visually Impaired that further connected me with Land of Sky, where I became a consultant for Buncombe County's Transportation Service for the Visually Impaired. I became actively involved through Buncombe County with uh, creating uh, social and athletic activities for the visually impaired in Western North Carolina, which led to an, uh, be an honorary chair for the fundraising for the new community to low vision clinic in Western North Carolina. This led to an advisory board position and eventually a full board position at IFB Solutions in Asheville in Winston-Salem. This led to be an honorary chair for an independent living community for the deaf and blind in Morganton, North Carolina. Amidst all of this, I led Helios Warriors, a nonprofit organization providing holistic care to veterans with PTSD and other mental health issues. Within Lions, I have held numerous state and local leadership positions, and most recently, including president of Western North Carolina Lions Incorporated, which owns and operates an assisted living center in Black Mountain. And while serving as president, I guided the organization through the COVID-19 pandemic. And in not recognizing state lines as a deterrent for service, I joined the board of Lions Vision Services 15 months ago. The pandemic shifted my public speaking events to virtual events, and I have become more involved locally, working with individuals in Western North Carolina who are new to vision loss, serving as a mentor life coach. I am sure this random of service, I have forgotten some position or organization along the way. But the question for today is what value do I add as a visually impaired individual who is differently abled and perfectly capable? And I just answered it with that question. By being differently abled, and in this case, visually impaired, I and others like me have faced the barriers and obstacles not seen by most sighted individuals. We have had to find ways to navigate the system to be able to lead fulfilling and productive lives. For example, and you don't hear me saying this, scheduling a mountain mobility trip, the county transportation van service for the dis disabled and elderly in Buncombe County to a dentist office I have never been to and never plan on going to just so I can go to lunch with my friends at a restaurant next door. Imagine it like this, you want a portrait painting of your dog and with exquisite detail, who are you going to seek out? I know I'd seek out someone with the talent of Cass Cassius Marcellus Coolidge who painted the well-known painting, Dogs Playing Poker. Okay, that may also have to do with my fondness of dogs and my luck at playing poker. The point being, whatever service you are seeking, or in this case, providing, what would be more valuable than insight from the group you are serving? I love the saying, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. The hardships of finding physical and financial accessible access to care, learning how to organize one's clothes to identify them, putting toothpaste on a toothbrush, knowing rights covered under the American Disabilities Act, all these big and small things are wheels the visually impaired community have invented or have strong ideas on the invention. How better to serve people your organization has identified as in need of service than to have someone from that community serving beside you. If you want your work to have value, place the value in those you serve and give them a seat at the table. Just yesterday, while I was using the transportation service with my insurance company to get to an appointment, Frank, the driver, and I began having a conversation about my appointment that was at the prosthetics provider to get my AFO leg brace adjusted because his son wore two AFO braces due to muscular dystrophy. When Frank pulled up, he was in an older minivan. He had long gray straggly hair tied back in a ponytail and a shaggy long beard wearing a, flated, a faded flannel shirt and faded blue jeans with a few holes. He did look like a character right out of Deliverance. Now, yes, I did verify that he was my driver and shared my trip information with my partner. Our conversation went on to the challenges 
he faces trying to find adaptive sports for his sons. Now, using my connections within the Buncombe County Parks and Recreation, I connected him immediately right then with the supervisor. And right before me, he had a conversation and was invited to attend a meeting the next week. When Frank dropped me off at my appointment, there were tears in his eyes and he could not wait to see his son get off the bus at 4.30 when he, so he could tell his son all about it. In moments like this, when we do not see the lack a person has, but instead see all their potentials and their desire to make a world a better place, not just for themselves, but for others, it is then that our organization can grow and expand more effectively. I know each of you can think of one individual or parent of an individual your organization has served who, could, who you could ask what more you can do to fill the need in their community with community being defined as the metrics of those you serve. If asking that question is valuable knowledge, then just think how valuable that person would be to your organization. If we go back to my ramblings of public service since losing my vision, it all stemmed from a member of Alliance Club in Asheville asking me to join. Everything else from there just flowed. If that person had not asked and given me the opportunity to say yes, would I be here today speaking with you? I don't know. What I do know is that that one ask opened the first door of many doors to follow and still more to come of impactful service. Be the one to ask. You may just be surprised at the outcome. Over the years, I have listened to many motivational speakers and one person in particular has resounded with me. Neil Marcus is a disability advocate who was diagnosed with a muscular disorder at the age of eight. He says, disability is not a brave struggle or the courage to face adversity. Disability is an act, an ingenious way of, to live. I agree with Neil and I'll take being called a genius any day. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you today. I hope I have provided you with an insightful look into my life of service and how none of us are defined by any conditions or labels. To conclude, there are two things that have become my favorite sayings. The first, always believe in the impossible. It is not impossible. It is I'm possible. And the last, is how I end every letter, email, written correspondence or communication. So I will end with it here today, seeing beyond limits. Thank you. Awesome. Dr. Mary, thank you so very much for taking the time to share your incredible and inspirational story with us today. Um, we were captivated by your words and we appreciate um, your perspective and your story uh, in our work. And so um, there are a couple of questions that we have here that I thought we might spend the next few minutes working through. Um, and one of those, I know that you'll enjoy this, Dr. Mary, feel free to take this and run with it. Would you explain more about eSight glasses and what they do? <laughs> yes, okay. So what these glasses are is there is a camera right here in the middle that in real time is going through computer algorithms housed in the upper part of the glasses and is displaying vivid and enhanced images on two organic light emitting diode displays that are higher quality than any cell phone or TV out there. And because it's such a vivid and enhanced image, it allows the paraphobia to fill in the areas that the phobia has deficits thus improving the uh, vision. So if I tilt these glasses up, I can tell there's a light on the, on the computer screen. And if it was a bigger image and someone was moving their hand, I could probably see a hand moving. I put these glasses down and I'm zoomed in now probably about 12, yeah, about 12 times. And I can see everybody's faces. And if I, I can zoom in up to 24 times right on the side of the glasses, and then I can read everybody's names. Okay, in the middle of my screen is, is Sam Hook. So, uh, 
and I can secretly video you without you knowing it, but I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, the eSight glasses have been uh, just an incredible device for, for so many individuals. And Dr. Mary, we appreciate your work at Lions Vision Services to help us um, provide more of those in South Carolina through our vision technology program. Um, so we're excited about more um, opportunities there uh, in the future. Uh, one question that came to mind uh, in listening to your story, um, Dr. Mary, is there is um, so much uh, just powerful intentionality behind all of the decisions that you've made and all of the steps that you've taken along the way. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if you could share your insight for someone who's listening to this and wants to better engage specifically the blind and visually impaired community, uh, but maybe is concerned about not finding someone with as much intentionality as you. What are suggestions, what are steps that organizations like ours can take to be more um, inclusive and more intentional about partnering with um, the blind and visually impaired, um, particularly those that may not have the degree of intentionality that you do? And, and that is a very good point because as I was preparing to give this presentation, that was one thing I was thinking about. I know I come with a background, you know, being very intelligent, medical background, always been, had a life of service, and it was just a natural progression. But in, during the pandemic, in the work that I have done with those visually, those who have new to vision loss here in Buncombe County, I have been amazed to find out their different backgrounds, their strengths. And if I had not even asked them what they did for a living previously, would never have known. One woman that I have been working with who has macular degeneration and has quickly gone from being able to pay her bills to not even being able to see her bills and her clothes and everything, she actually was a uh, nonprofit fundraiser. That came out in the second or third conversation we had. There are individuals out there who are visually impaired, whether they have education or not, it is their life experience that they can bring to the table that is important. And I know so many of the visually impaired that I work, that I work with and are friends with, they want an opportunity to give back just as like others have given to them. And they just need to ask. It's, it's really that simple. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I remember at one point, one of the international presidents uh, in Lions Clubs, uh, I think their slogan was just ask or, or mm -hmm. ask one or, or something along those lines. Um, so that's um, a good reminder. You know, you, you never make any of the shots that you don't take. <laughs> right. You just have to go out there and, and give it a swing sometimes. What other um, questions do y'all have uh, for Dr. Mary this morning? Feel free to take yourself off of mute as well if you'd like to just jump in and uh, either offer your thoughts or insights or, or specific questions as well. Are you still able to practice medicine? <laughs> well, okay. When I, shortly after I first went out of practicing, I was having lots of discussions with malpractice insurance companies trying to explain to them that babies did have bungee cords and that it would be okay for me to practice. They didn't quite bite on that. So no, I am not currently practicing. I made a decision and plus now being so far out, I'd have to go back and repeat a residency. It's not worth it. The What I'm able to do as a volunteer with my life experiences, helping others is far more meaningful than if I even went back into the bureaucracy of medicine. Now to that, I also know if I was in the same position today as I was 20 years ago when I went out of practicing and the same things that happened for me, there are so many things different that would have, that either a residency program and or an employer would be able to provide for me that I would be able to continue in a career in medicine. But that's the difference of 20 years.
Dr. Mary, I'll uh, put another question out there. Um, one of the topics that our group has talked about uh, off and on over the years has been transportation and the, the lack of accessible transportation options in South Carolina. I'm sure our progressive forward thinking friends to the north and in North Carolina are light years ahead of us in, in all of these regards, right? But um, uh, what are some things, if, if you could offer specific um, policy recommendations or um, advocacy suggestions for individuals or organizations that are trying to expand access to transportation um, in, in all parts of South Carolina, particularly some of the rural communities, uh, what would your advice uh, be? And that is a very difficult uh, topic because when, for a while, I was living in a more rural area of Western North Carolina, and the transportation was a lot more difficult than it is now that I'm living in Asheville proper. Um, one of the hardest things as somebody who is disabled is the length of being on county transportation. You know, there are times that it's inevitable you'll be on the van two hours either before or after your appointment. And that can prove to be a very long and difficult day. There are health insurances that now are providing transportation, such as I used yesterday, that it's a direct ride using uh, one of the uh, cab companies locally to provide that direct transportation. Creating those networks with those cab companies, also here in Buncombe County, there's a rideshare voucher program through Mountain Mobility. So for $100 worth of taxi vouchers, I pay $25 for that book. In other words, for every $10, I pay $2.50. And for what would normally be a $30 trip, I pay $7.50. That is extremely helpful. It's in taking the resources that exist and working together and combining them to find that solution that almost always is gonna be the answer. Uh, who provides you with the uh, the bullet? Is it the government that, that does it? Is it something that the uh, cab companies do or how does how this? With the taxi voucher forms or which one? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. How how did the how did the vouchers work? Who's funding the discounts of the vouchers? Magnificent yeah. program. So the vouchers are actually through Land of Sky, which is um, who owns and operates Mountain Mobility, the county transportation service, and they have set this up with the um, cab companies. I know it's through a grant program, and of course, each year it's as long as funding is available, but. I've never had a problem getting vouchers and I have now shared the program with several of my friends and we are all now have a way to get places that don't require a medical appointment. So we can actually go directly from our house to a restaurant or to a bowling alley or movie theater, wherever we wanna go. And it doesn't have the restrictions of a medical appointment. So if anybody is interested in learning more about that, I can get you in contact with the supervisor at Land of Sky to learn more about how they have established that. Yes, please, that would be great. Even if he knows of maybe other counties um, around here, I don't know if he's connected with some of the other county transportation uh, leaders, but that would be great. Yeah, I can definitely, um, actually the group email that the, uh, invite went out to, I can send out, I'll just send out the information in that. I'd be glad to. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Fantastic. Are there any other uh, questions for Dr. Mary today? Dr. Mary, I um, had to hop off because I, I got a call from a doctor. So I might, I apologize. <laughs> this is redundant. I'm hopping back on. But I am curious to know, you said you started your own public speaking business. So is this something that you do at events and um, maybe even galas, that kind of thing? So 
I no longer, so I still do the public speaking. It's no longer under a formal business. Um, unfortunately, in 2011, my father became ill and my mom had already been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's and my time had to be shifted uh, to care for them. And so I let the official business go. And mm -hmm. since then, I now do the public speaking more on it's a volunteer basis. Oh so, my God, that's yes. even, that's fantastic. <laughs> well, maybe I can connect with you later on and we can talk about um, an opportunity. We would spoil you rotten if you would come. Sounds wonderful, I will take it. <laughs> and Amy is pretty close to you, Dr. Mary. Uh, Servants for Sight is based out of Greenville, South Carolina. Okay. So very, very close to, to Asheville, just down the road and um, a, a very um, exciting LVS partner as well. Very good. We love it. Be kind. And I would also like to extend my email information was included on that email invite. If you have any other questions or anything else you'd like to discuss with me, please feel free to reach out to me at any point in time. I will. Awesome. Will do, yes, Dr. Sir. Mary, and uh, we'll make sure to share uh, that information in our follow-up uh, resources as well. So if others have questions or comments or if folks are watching this uh, online and want to um, get in touch with you uh, after seeing the recording, that they can um, reach out. So thank you so much for your time and your help. Um, we will cut you loose. We've got a, a little bit more time as a group where we uh, hang around and um, talk about um, programs and needs and upcoming events and opportunities. You're welcome to stay for that if you want, but um, feel free to uh, get on with your day as well. Well, I am off to physical therapy to hopefully do some more boxing today. So I will leave you guys. Thank you for this opportunity. I greatly appreciate it and have a fantastic day. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Mary. All right. Bye. Um, as we transition to the um, new business portion of our program, um, I can tell that we're going to have to send out a little bit of email follow up where we've had some attrition as we've gone through the meeting here. Um, we had originally when we created these platforms um, set aside an hour and a half since we were just meeting on a quarterly basis. Um, based on uh, today's activity, I'm, I'm sensing that it might be time to uh, evaluate going to a, a one hour format just to um, help fit into people's schedules. For those of you that are still on the call, uh, does that work better for you or would you do you value the extra time at the end and would you prefer to keep it an hour and a half? Either way is fine with me. I um, love attending and then of course sometimes schedules don't allow, but either way you do it, I'll do my best to be here. Sure. Yeah, I think the hour and a half is, is fine. All of your presenters have been so brilliant. I would hate to, to um, cut them short. I remember the Sisters of Charity comes to mind. Um, um, absolutely, Dr. Mary was, was just so inspirational and hearing less of her would have been you know, sad because she's so she's so wonderful. Yeah, that that is the challenge. Um, if if we keep the the guest speaker format, um, cutting it down to uh, just an hour would limit the time that we would have with the speaker um, to also share updates and programs and deal with logistical stuff. So. <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir too, because you all are the ones that hung in there for <laughs> right up until the end. Um, I'll send out uh, an email with a call for feedback on that. Uh, for those of you that are still on the call in general, does the format that we used in 2022 work for y'all for the virtual meetings? Um, I think we alternated between Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Uh, we kept it in the morning from nine to 1030, and it was usually the third, um, either Wednesday or Tuesday of the month. Um, does that general time frame work well? Or are there consistent challenges that y'all have with certain scheduling dates? Yeah. Daniel, I agree with Kay and Amy. This is Rhonda. Good morning to you. And I just, um, the time frame to, to answer your question, your most, your last question, I think it's great. The time frame works and kind of gets us going and before we get into all the other aspects of the day and I like the hour and a half because like we say if we agree and folks drop off and the speaker's finished and we um we conclude a little sooner that's okay too you know we can say well we 
we'll stop, but but scheduling it for an hour and a half works for me too. So okay. Wonderful, Rhonda. Thank you. All right. Um, if there's no other uh, comments from a scheduling standpoint, when I when I send out that follow up email, I'll send some proposed dates uh, for next year that are consistent with the uh, scheduling that we used for this year, so that we can go ahead and lock those up. Um, I know if uh, we all are, are incredibly busy, and the sooner we get those days on the calendar, uh, the better for for all of us. So, <laughs> uh, appreciate your help with that. Um, we do have the OneDrive folder that I hope uh, you all are um, finding useful and helpful. Um, we continue to update that uh, on a regular basis. And as we have some transitions with contacts uh, with some of our members, uh, Taryn has been added as the new operations site contact um, now that she's stepped into the executive director role there. Um, I know we're still waiting for uh, Dr. Carol Page's replacement from the South Carolina Assistive Technology Program. Um, I've reached out again there to see if they've filled that position. If anybody has uh, additional insight there, uh, I'd love to connect with them. Um, Rachel Johnson is the new Carol Page, and I can send you her email. Awesome. That'd be great, Kay. Thank you. I had a hunch someone in this group might know. <laughs> We definitely want to invite them and make sure that they have a seat at the table. Um, on the PDF that I am looking at, which is what I'm assuming uh, you all have as well, I see that um, there's a typo. Uh, the deadline for uh, our monthly newsletter content is not August 30th. That was uh, a couple months ago now. That's ancient history as it goes. Um, but if y'all have uh, updates on news or programs or calls to action that you would like for us to feature in our next um, Palmetto Vision Alliance email. If y'all could get that to me by October 31st, I will uh, have it sent out the first or second week in November. Um, and just with the holidays and everything, that will probably be the last one of the year. So um, if you've got stuff uh, really through the end of the year that you'd like to include in that, um, please feel free to send that over to me and we will be sure to feature it. Uh, are there any other updates, any other um, announcements or information that y'all would like to talk about? Any other uh, challenges that you're facing that we can help with? Amy, I see you're unmuted, but um, uh, we're not able to, to hear you. Did you have something? I was deciding if I was going to say it and how I was going to say it. <laughs> so gotcha. we, have, we have a problem with, um, we're having a difficult time with our retina patients because our parameters only allow us to do um, typically, you know, between nine months and 12 months of care. And a lot of these patients need ongoing care. I didn't know if anybody had it advice on how they, because we're supposed to be just kind of a temporary program. So I didn't know if anybody had advice on um, just kind of ongoing eye care for people, like how the free medical clinics will just have a, a patient for their whole lives if they need to do that. You know, that's not how we're set up. And I don't know of any other resources to pick them up after that, after our nine to 12 months. Would anybody like to jump in and take that? And I didn't know if anybody would have an answer. I just didn't know if anybody had come across a similar situation. Now, Amy, and I'm so sorry. I was listening to you and then, um, but can repeat, the, there was a technical thing. Can you repeat um, your question? You said it. Yeah, I did, was curious on if um, if you guys offered continuous care in what you did, or if you limited the time to which you provided care. And if you did limit the time, um, I was curious to see how you handled the continuous care. Well, uh, be honest with you, we sort of look back at the medical professionals on that. What we do is let's say someone has that retinal detachment, we want to get them to a stable place. Right. Um, 
with that, or we also are sponsoring y'all. I'm really excited about that in this fiscal year. And I think I touched on it before um, quickly, but we are sponsoring two types of laser glaucoma treatments. Okay. There's no anesthesia, you know, no drops involved. So again, that's not an ongoing. So anything um, looking at cross-linking, doing that, um, cataracts, all that. So the stabilization, we have helped with some folks with some, um, you know, where it, it it started out, it was going to be one or two treatments of a of a laser, um, someone with diabetes, and then, it, it, you know, another appointment, another appointment, and we had to say, okay, can we get them to a place, you know, kind of working with the medical staff, you know, back and forth to get them where they were comfortable and mm -hmm. then back away. So there's not, um, and we have built into our policy too, Amy, some exceptions, you know, so it's difficult to say. It's kind of a case by case on that, where that person is and, um, but yeah, it can't go on just indefinitely like, okay, they're my source and, right, you know, yeah. Um, so we try to, we want to be there and it's, um, that's the only drawback. And I know I'm sure Daniel, Kate, y'all would probably agree, even from the Lions Vision Services, you, anybody that knocks on the door, you want to say yes. <laughs> and, you, you know, you want to continuously help, but you, you do have to, have to get them to, I, I say, I like the phrase that comfortable place and, you know. Yeah, that's way to put it, get them to a comfortable place. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we're, we're in the same boat and the retina issue has been one that uh, we have kicked around an awful lot because there are uh, so often recurring and lifetime uh, care needs there and we just don't have the funding mechanisms in place to support that kind of open-ended and, and ongoing care. If we can provide an immediate service, whether it's an eye surgery or a vision technology device or an eye exam or something uh, that could make a, a tangible difference that could get that client um, towards that comfortable place. That's really what we're, what we're focused on. And uh, I certainly hope one day we will have the funding available to uh, provide more ongoing and long-term care for those that need it um, because we, we recognize the need. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's not something that I have found a good solution to anywhere in the state uh, in having a lot of these kind of conversations. The hard part for us too is that like our doctors will want to do it, but the office managers kind of limit them to, you know, just because from the business side of things, mm -hmm. they hate to inhibit somebody's volunteerism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. That, that's helpful. Thank you. At least I know I'm not the only one out. That's also all very right. helpful. Yeah. And Amy, You're thanks for all y'all do too. It's, it's wonderful. And I always remember if they have, two cataracts, send them to us. If they only have one, we refer to, to you all here in the upstate. So, um, Thanks. you know, that way we don't miss, miss anybody. And there, you know, on the positive side, there's so many that we do. I'm sure y'all, um, y'all would agree that there's so many people that we have great success, you know, they have restored vision, healthy sight, and it's, it's life-changing. So, um, Anyway, and we're interviewing now. We have, I think I mentioned this too, just kind of uh, restating this just in case, but we have Ms. Cornelius. She is our prevention coordinator centralized in Columbia, but we're hiring for the Greenville area, uh, Charleston, and that the PD area, Florence Conway. So we'll have four. We'll have one in each region. We have four regions the way we're structured. Oh, very cool. That's right. wonderful. Rhonda. Um, if you've got links to those applications, uh, if they will still be up through November, uh, we'd love to feature those in our, our newsletter. That's great. Yes, Daniel. And, you know, just immediately, I can tell you they're on the state uh, site, job website. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, yeah, so we're just now, we've been just now interviewing. And so this, this is the time if, if you know great folks who are interested, you know, we, we also, uh, while I'm saying that, if... <laughs> This is good because y'all are, um, um, it's a great way to network. We have in our Rock Hill office and our Charleston office, we've been trying to fill our older blind counselor positions for those locations. So um, doing some double duty, a lot of us, you know, with those vacancies so we could keep services going. So um, that's something I think sometimes it's a matter of directing people to those sides. 
Absolutely. We just need for people to know about it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, Rhonda, I just caught your voice. Um, it's Kay from the Department on Aging. I uh, see you, Kay. I wasn't showing myself today. I guess I should. That's terrible. We, we do sometimes. I'm sorry to be slow. I just caught your voice. Um, this is this is personal. Do you guys do the um, the e site glasses for your clients for the people? You know, my daughter. Um, right. My daughter uh, Bailey. Um, is that something that you all provide? That's something you could. Um, yeah, we could possibly talk. It, you, I, I don't want to say that that's not a um, a no. Uh, you know, at this point, I know that's. Um, I know in that's theory, not, I mean, in, in, in theory, not it, because I think, I mean, I sound, you know, I, I thank you for the iPads. I thank you for the CCTVs, <laughs> you know, yeah. I thank you for all of the other things that you do, but that's what she was describing. It seemed like it'd be really great. And, um, um, Amy and Danny, I don't, I don't know if you know, my daughter is vision impaired and she is a junior at Smith college and she, um, is a client of the commission. And uh, so anyway, so I, I heard about that and I was going to, oh, I was like, oh, I need to ask. And then I, I didn't, I didn't figure out R.S. Thompson was you. So, so ah. I could just ask you. <laughs> yes. And, and I want to say, you know, um, Kay, that's something, yeah, uh, want to follow back up with her counselor. Okay. I would say that, kind of look at the case and um because you know, eSight glasses, I mean, they're wonderful. That's a it's a it's been again, I use that phrase life changing for a lot of people out there, but it's something to I think that has to be considered. Uh, look at a lot of things, you know. So you'd want to definitely reach out to her counselor on that. I wouldn't say it was in, impossible because um, it is one of those technology devices and we're all about that here you know adaptive aids and and different equipment that would help somebody be successful in school and in their daily lives so um I know I can just tell you that's that's not something of course it hasn't been requested but that's not something we're doing on our senior program um so but I wouldn't want to I don't think we're closing the door on it and it just kind of depends on the circumstances Okay. Um, thank you for, for your yeah. advice and I will, I will follow up, um, Absolutely. um, with them. And while I'm throwing stuff out, Steve Cook is a great presenter. I don't know if he's ever presented. He works for the commission and he, is. he does their assistive technology. Since Rhonda is on, I'll do a commercial for him. He's phenomenal. Yeah. Okay. I know different people, Daniel, will cross my mind. I know, Daniel, we've invited you. I think um, our consumer service director, Karma uh, Marshall, had invited you, I think, to speak to our group and um, just um, enlightening them, giving them more details about Lions Vision Services and all that, yeah. what we do, what you all do, and how we work together. And um, so they could meet you directly. But yes, um, I'm thinking, Kay, thank you for saying that. I I thought I think of folks since we've had these guest speakers and they have um, wonderful stories and you know um, you say Steve um, he's does a fantastic job and I've had people um, one lady comes to mind that she said you know she had some some pretty significant vision loss senior lady and he had gone by and this probably was a few years ago y'all pre COVID and. He was setting up his driver. You know, he just thought the lady told me, she said, I thought he was just another gentleman with him. I didn't know he drove him. Said he was just awesome, setting things up, discussing things with her. And she said, you know, I did not know. He um, could not see until he asked me where my outlet was in the, the room. And that there was just a couple. And she thought he, because he was just such, um, you know, so well adjusted. And yeah, he's got a great story. Um, a lot of times they, um, he and his wife both will share like with the teens, you know, teenage programs. And I was just thinking when I was listening to um, Dr. Um, Amy, then I said, you know, uh, Dr. Mary, excuse me, Dr. Mary, I said uh, she would be, that would be awesome to have her motivate when we have our summer teens and all of that. I think people who have goals and very ambitious but maybe discouraged not sure how that's going to work or to hear her story like that so 
definitely. Rhonda, for whatever it's worth, I was thinking the same thing that she would be great. Um, yeah. With with the transitions group and the younger group, I I, I uh, thought I, mm -hmm. I thought it would be really really inspirational. Um, the academic component, how she didn't let that stop her. Uh, yes. I, I just I totally second your second that thought of yours. I think she'd be phenomenal. Y'all, please um, feel free to reach out to her. And if uh, you want me to to nudge or to endorse, um, I, I know that she would be uh, eager to to look at that. Um, I, I know that she would be happy to get involved and, and to help there. And and Rhonda, if you um, run into to Karma and uh, want to check in on that, I would love to pick up those conversations again. I know the meeting that I was supposed to be at um, either got canceled or moved, and I, I never um, was able to to find out exactly when. Uh, a good next time would be to um, come back and, and be with y'all, but I would love to do that. I would love to um, be more connected to, to the commission. And certainly uh, if Steve could be one of our presenters for 2023, um, we uh, want to, I think, try to keep the same kind of balance that we've had where we wanna hear some fundraising resources. We wanna hear more from the clients and the individuals specifically that we're serving. Um, and if there are other topics that y'all would like for us to find speakers on, um, please let me know. We would love to go after those. Um, have you thought about Don Mullen? I have not, no. Tell Don, me more. It was when you said fundraising, that made me, she's at the state library and she's the kind of a air quotes, rent a grant writer, rent a researcher program. Um, mm -hmm. I met her through Paola uh, and she's pretty great, but, but that's what they, that's what they do. They, they help, you know, it's kind of, they're teaching people how to fish, um, how to go after grants and the state library. And since we're all South, you know, South Carolinians, they have a variety of resources and she might be a good presenter um, as a resource, not in the, not in the way that Sisters of Charities was where they're actually granted, but just to say, I can help you. I can help you yeah. find funding. I can help you do this. And again, it's taxpayer, you know, we're all paying for it anyway, so. Yeah, Kay, do you have uh, Dawn's email or phone number? Your thing bounced back when I sent you, uh, Raish, and it's, and, and it's she's, she describes her name like a ray of sunshine. So we don't always yeah. have to call her new Carol Page, even though she does answer to new Carol Page because Carol was so great. <laughs> um, but it's Ray of Sunshine. Do you want me to put it in the chat or you want me to email it to you? Uh, sure, you can put it in the chat. I, I wrote down uh, Rachelle's uh, email there and then I'll follow up with her. And um, same with, with Steve. Um, Rhonda, if you would like to maybe help us with that or connect us with Steve, I would love to have a conversation with him. Sure, sure. I had written that down, Daniel. I already wrote down um, to follow up with Karma to see about you know when you could share with the group too and then we could kind of, connect with Steve and see if he's willing to speak. Great. I'm sure he would be, I'm sure. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, any other announcements or updates or information for the good of the cause? All right, well, I will give you all back uh, 10 minutes of your day today. And um, thank you all so much again for um, being a part of this group. We value and appreciate your time and your partnership and all of the hours of service that y'all pour in to help the people of South Carolina. Um, so hang in there, finish the year strong and keep in touch as we um, go into uh, 2023. So thank you all, be safe. Thank well. you, y'all have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Can you hang out for a minute? Bye. Sure, yeah. Bye.